If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, why don't you make your way to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel 9. We have a lot to cover this morning. I um, hope you guys are comfortable, as comfortable as you can be in those plastic chairs. Maybe hopefully you brought a snack. This might get like, listen, I was a, my, my wife and daughter are in the back with the seedlings, and I told them this might be a little bit of a longer one this morning. And they're like, oh, great. <laughs> no, they, they, they love your kids. They love me back there. Uh, but hey, we're, we're going chapter nine. We got 27 verses to get into. And so let's just get after it. Uh, last week in our narrative, we left off with Israel demanding a king. Uh, Samuel was getting old. His sons were not a good choice to replace him as judges of Israel. And quite frankly, the Israelites were looking around at all the other nations and they wanted to be just like all the other nations, including having a king just like all the other nations. God's desire was for them to remain a theocracy, meaning ruled by God. In fact, that's what Israel means, governed by God. That was God's design, but they didn't want God's design. They wanted to be a monarchy. They wanted to have a king. And as we saw in chapter 8, God told Samuel, hey, don't take it personally. It's not you. It's me. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So go ahead and give them what they want. Let's give him a king. And if I can bring you all the way back to where we began a few months ago in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, it'll be up on the screen also. But this is how the narrative began. It says, there was a certain man. Uh, there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Sophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. And that word Zuf, we're actually going to see again in our passage this morning, but that's where it began. There was a certain man, and that's how chapter 9 begins as well. There was a certain man. And so chapter 9 begins the uh, second act of 1 Samuel. This is a transition point from the time of judges to the time of kings. And so this is act 2, scene 1 that we're diving into this morning. Let me just forewarn you, this is an unusual story. Um, but as we prepare to read this story, let me also remind you that this is God's word. And therefore it is inspired by God and therefore it is profitable for us, uh, for us to dive into and to glean from God's word. And so if you're ready to glean, why don't you stand with me? <clears throat> We're going to read the first 14 verses together. 1 Samuel chapter 9 says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphiah, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. He had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to the servant, but if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is, no, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. <clears throat> Verse 11. And they went up to the hill 
to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? They answered, he is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. And as soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. And we'll stop right there for now and remind you that this is indeed the word of God. May God add his blessing to the reading and the proclamation and the reception of his word. Amen. You guys can have a seat. <clears throat> and so chapter 8, last week, chapter 8 ended with God telling Samuel to give the people what they want. Give them a king. And then chapter 9 begins with an introduction to a man named Saul. And so the obvious literary suggestion is that Saul is going to be the king that they're asking for. He's going to be the first king of Israel. And we learn a few things about Saul right off the bat. We learn that Saul is from a wealthy family. We learn that he's young, he's tall, and he's handsome. And all the single ladies said, amen, sign me up. He's wealthy, he's young, he's tall, and he's handsome. In fact, he's not only tall, but he is the tallest man in all of Israel. And he's not only handsome, but he is the most handsome man in all of Israel. I'm not sure exactly how that is judged. It seems a little bit subjective to me, but apparently they had some kind of panel of judges that declared, yeah, you, you're the guy. I mean, you're, you're gorgeous. Um, he was, you know, he was People Magazine's sexiest man of the year that year. This is Saul. He was a poster boy for what the Israelites wanted in a king. In fact, the name Saul means asked for, asked for. All right, be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. This is what the people asked for. And spoiler alert, Saul is not going to be a good king. He will do some good things, but all in all, his reign is going to be a fail. In fact, by his own admission towards the end of his life, we're going to see this uh, probably in March or April when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 26. But go ahead and put that one up. 1 Samuel 26, 21. Towards the end of his life, this is what he says. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. He does a whole lot of things that are foolish. He does not reign well. He would not go down in the Jewish history books as a good king. And I want you to notice all of the positive descriptions that we have about Saul in the first two verses are completely hereditary. Right? They are completely uncreditable, if that's a word. We cannot credit them to Saul because he had nothing to do with being wealthy. He had nothing to do with being young or tall or handsome. In fact, we don't see anything at all about his character. It doesn't say that he was wise or that he was kind or that he was humble or generous or patient or had a good sense of humor. None of that. All the adjectives that we see are simply external qualities. And judging the book by its cover, Saul was perfect. He was exactly what the people were looking for. He was the stereotypical image of a king. And this is what they wanted. They wanted the image of a king. They didn't want the substance of a king because they already had the substance of his king. His name was Yahweh and they rejected him. They wanted a tangible king. And they get Saul. And Saul is, again, he's like, if you were the casting director, Saul is exactly who you would choose to be the king by outward appearances. He's big, he's strong, he's tall, dark, and handsome. He's got a chiseled jawline, right? Kiddos, he was probably mewing a little bit. You adults have no idea what I'm talking about, but I got kiddos. All right, ask a kid. But listen, there was, there was nothing, I don't even know if I use that right. Did I use that right? Yeah. Is it like this? All right. I see you. I see you, Kaya. I'm also the youth pastor here. I, I learn things. Um, but listen, there's nothing about his character, right? 
And so some of you might remember what happens when the second king is selected. David, who I would say was really God's first choice for a king, but Israel got out ahead of them. Remember, Israel was not patient. They were not on God's timeline. They demanded a king now, and so they got Saul. But some of you might remember in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when David is selected, um, God tells Samuel that it's time for a new king. It's time to replace Saul. And God tells Samuel to go to the house of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, and he is going to show him which of Jesse's sons is going to be the next king. And he first meets the oldest son named Eliab. And Samuel is like, man, I, just completely enamored. Like, surely this is the next king. But look up at the screen. This is how it goes in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says, when Samuel came to the house of Jesse, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And church, the Lord still looks on the heart today. The Lord is still interested in your heart. And so I ask you, have you had open heart surgery? Have you had a heart transplant have you had, as Ezekiel puts it, where God takes out your heart of stone and he gives you a heart of flesh? Is your heart being transformed? How do you know? How do you know if your heart's being transformed? Examine your fruit. Examine your fruit because everything that you do say or think is an overflow of what comes out of your heart. Your heart is the central operating system of everything else in your life. It is the barometer of everything else in your life. In fact, what Proverbs says is, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What Jesus says in Luke chapter six is out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart gauges and is the thermostat for everything else. And God is interested in your heart. How's your heart? I want you to notice something else about the first two verses of 1 Samuel 9. Not only is nothing mentioned about, about Saul's character, but nothing is said about his relationship with God either. Why? Probably because there's nothing to say. Saul's spiritual state reflected the spiritual state of the entire nation of Israel. He looked really good on the outside, but inside he was fruitless. He was the equivalent of the Pharisees in Jesus's day. If any of you have a King James version, chapter two actually says that Saul was a goodly man. Instead of handsome, it says he was goodly. He was the goodliest of all Israel. He may have been goodly, but he was not godly. And so we learn in verse three, that Saul's father has lost some donkeys. All right, donkeys have gotten loose. They've gotten out of the pasture since we live in Texas. Some of you perhaps have some ranching experience or maybe you've driven some, you know, back roads, some of the county roads, and maybe you've seen cows or goats that have gotten loose. It still happens today, 3,000 years later, and we still can't figure out how to keep our cattle where they belong. Uh, my in-laws, Carrie's parents live in Zorn, which is about 20, 25 minutes from here. Uh, where she grew up. She's a country girl. I'm a city boy. Uh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Um, but, but they still live out on that farm or on the ranch and they have some cows and it is not uncommon for their cows to get out. About once a year or so, they, you know, especially if there's a drought, the cows start pushing through and, and my father-in-law has to go wrangle them up and get them back in and fix the fence. Um, and speaking of donkeys, uh, a few years ago on Christmas, um, a donkey wandered onto their pasture and they had no idea where it came from. And our kids, we, we came over with the kids and the kids were all excited. They're like, can we keep it? Is this a new pet? Can we keep it? <laughs> like, what do you mean we, first of all? And they're like, we've asked all the neighbors. No one knows whose it is. And so, yeah, we're, we're going to keep it safe so it doesn't get hit by a truck. And, and we'll see if we can figure out where it goes. And they had it for about two weeks. My kids actually named it Dominic. Um, some of you guys might be familiar with a, a lesser known Christmas song called Dominic, the Italian Christmas donkey. Anybody? Some of you. Um, 
my, my father-in-law was actually a, a missionary in Italy growing up, and so it, was, it just seemed right. Dominic the Italian Christmas donkey. Uh, finally, after a few weeks, um, I, I think someone posted like a mile up the road, missing donkey or lost donkey. And so my father-in-law went and it was their donkey that had traveled over a mile. Bless you, Kareem. Man, bless you times six, I believe. No, don't be sorry. Allergies are tough right now. Um, not sure why I was talking about Dominic. I guess just an, another donkey story. But listen, th this is what happened. Saul's dad, Kish, his donkeys had gotten loose. And even though he was a, ma a man of great wealth, he was still interested in recovering his donkeys. In fact, the donkeys may have been the reason why Kish was so rich. Because donkeys in that day were incredibly important and valuable burdens of, uh, I, I guess I would say beasts of burdens. Right? They, would, they would use donkeys to transport things. And so we could think in our day and age, like if you lost a couple of your F-150s from your fleet, like you're going to want to find them. You're going to want to track them down and see where they are. And so Kish tells Saul to grab a servant and he sends them out on this wild goose chase or wild donkey chase, as it were. And they travel all throughout the hill country and they cannot find the donkeys anywhere. And after three days, Saul starts to worry. He's like, I don't know what, you know, my dad might be worrying about us. Maybe we should just cut our losses. We can't find them. Let's just go back home. But the servant isn't quite ready yet. What, what the servant says in verse six is, look, we're in the land of Zuf right now. And what I've heard is that there is an incredible man of God in this land. And he's a prophet. Like he's able to tell people all this stuff. Maybe if we can find him, then he'll tell us where we can go to find the donkeys. And Saul's like, uh, I mean, but we don't even have anything to give him. I, I don't know what to give him. And he's like, well, I got, I got like a quarter of a shekel of silver. Maybe I can give them, like, let's just go, Saul. And Saul decides to green light this idea. What's interesting here is that the servant seems to demonstrate more leadership ability than Saul does right? He has more knowledge. He's coming up with ideas. He's figuring out how to get things done. And Saul just kind of seems to just be cumbersome. Like he, he's just kind of there, right? Not really adding any value at all to the whole expedition. And so we start to wonder at this point, how strong of a leader can Saul actually be? How is he going to lead the entire nation of Israel if he can't even figure out a donkey expedition? But nevertheless, Saul's like, all right, this sounds like a plan. Let, let, let's do it. Let's try to find this guy. Let's try to find this prophet. And they start making their way up to, uh, up to the city. And we see in verse 11 that they meet some young women who are coming out to draw water. And they ask these ladies, hey, is the seer here? The seer. Now, this is the first time in scripture that the word seer is used. Um, I guess we could say it's the third time because it's used twice in verse nine. L look up again at verse nine. This is kind of a uh, parenthetical addition that the author gives us. He says, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, come, let us go to the seer for today's prophet was formerly known as a seer. The word seer literally means one who sees, <laughs> as you may have guessed, a seer. It's one who sees into the future, perhaps. It's one who, who sees with, with great perception or awareness into certain situations. However, what we see there in, in verse 9 is that God did not like the term because it was often associated with divination and necromancy and witchcraft. And so God started calling his people prophets instead of seers. All right, there's some Bible trivia for you to pack away. And so verse 11, they come to these women and they say, is the seer here? And I like to imagine that there's a lost verse between verses 11 and 12, because I can only imagine that these women were probably just starting to giggle a little bit and blush a little bit like, oh my word, I have never seen anyone so beautiful in my life. Like, right, this guy's coming and they're actually, he's talking to them and their heart is beating out of their chest perhaps. But finally, when they collect themselves, they respond, yes, the seer actually, you just missed him. The seer actually just went that way. He's just ahead of you. If you hurry, you can leave now and you can probably catch him. And so Saul with the uh, tip of the hat and maybe a wink of the eye, 
Ladies, if you'll excuse us. <laughs> mewing, perhaps mewing. You're like, no wonder the sermon's so long. Get it together, Pastor. But Saul, Saul and the servant head up to the city. And so let's, let's read the next few verses. Look at verse 15. It says, Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, tell me, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. And so let's stop right there. And so, man, again, so, just so many interesting tidbits in these verses. And we can start with just another awkward dunce cap moment for Saul when he goes up to Samuel and he's like, hey, have you seen Samuel? And he's like, I am Samuel, <laughs> right? He, this is just, you know, probably one of the most recognizable people in all of Israel is Samuel. He has been the, the judge kind of priest prophet combination for decades. And Saul is clueless. Again, just, just another ominous feeling that we start to get about how Saul is actually going to do once he becomes king. But in verses 15 and 16, it says that God told Samuel the day before that he was going to send this man from the tribe of Benjamin and have Samuel anoint him as king. Or actually it says as prince. Did you see that? It actually uses the Hebrew word for prince instead of king. Perhaps, perhaps to reinforce the idea that there is only and ever will be one king over the people of Israel. And any earthly ruler is nothing more than a mere prince under the sovereign reign of the true king, Yahweh. And so God told Samuel exactly what to expect with incredibly specific details. He says, tomorrow I am going to send to you a man from the land of Benjamin. And how does God get Saul to Samuel? By using runaway donkeys. This is fascinating. Church, I think that there are oftentimes so many things in our lives that we chalk up to coincidence when in fact it is providence. It is God working in the ordinary mundane aspects of our lives to carry about his divine plans and purposes. Sometimes the Lord speaks very clearly to you, perhaps like he did with Samuel in fact, in verse 15, some translations have it as this. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear. Isn't that interesting? The Lord had spoken to Samuel in his ear. And when I saw that translation, it reminded me of what we looked at last week in chapter 8. If you look back to chapter 8, verse 21, it says, When Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord in the anthropomorphic ears of God. He spoke to God's ears and now God is speaking to his ears. In church, I would just say that when you speak to God, you are more likely to hear from God. And I think James would agree with that when he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I think David agrees with that. In Psalm 25 David says this, Psalm 25, 14, the secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. I love that idea that God is essentially perhaps whispering secrets into your ears, revealing his plan to you. Well, we saw last week in chapter eight, um, when, when they, the Israelites were demanding a king, it says that Samuel was displeased. And then what did he do when he was displeased? He prayed. He brought that displeasure to the Lord. The Lord was his first response. What do I do when I'm sad? What do I do when I'm confused? What do I do when I'm conflicted? Go to the Lord. Develop spiritual disciplines of prayer 
in meditation on the word with the Lord. And I believe, church, I believe that you will be more likely to hear from God. Now, it might be the still small voice of God. More than likely, it'll probably be God revealing the truth in his word because that is more than often how he communicates to us. And so God speaks directly and in great detail to Samuel. But for Saul, God gets him where he wants by using donkeys. Again, and we see this all throughout scripture, right? That God will use things that we might not think that God, and we just, we've already saw, seen this in, in 1 Samuel. If you remember back in chapter six, God used cows, milk cows. And now here in chapter nine, God uses donkeys. And maybe some of you can think of a time in your life where you were out chasing metaphorical donkeys and the Lord interrupted your otherwise normal life in a supernatural way. Anybody? And maybe it didn't even feel supernatural at the time. Maybe it all felt just very, very natural. But you look back now and you're like, gosh, God was, God was at work in that. Or maybe you look back now and you're like, what a coincidence, right? Or, or what are the odds? Like if, if this hadn't happened, then this one had happened, then this one had happened, and if this hadn't happened, then this one had happened, and I wouldn't even be where I am today. That's called Providence. It's called, you've heard people say, perhaps praise the luck. Well, praise the luck. No, praise the Lord. It, it is God who is working. And I would say it is God who is working in a thousand different ways behind the scenes right now in your life to carry about his providential plan according to his sovereign decree. Now listen, providence can be scary because you start to realize that you have a lot less control than you think you have. And a lot of us have control issues. And providence can be scary because you're not going to figure out his providence. You can't, you can't get your mind around his providence. His, high, his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But what you can do is learn to rest in his providence. Learn to trust his providence. Learn to trust that he is working all things together according to his sovereign plan for your good and for his glory. Oh, if we could just rest. The end of verse 16 is a beautiful picture of the father heart of God. He says, I have seen the affliction of my people for their cry has come to me. And this is interesting, or at least it was to me, because in the previous chapter, they're not, ha they're not content with God. We, we want an earthly king. Give us a king. And God's like, look, you guys have rejected me. Fine, I'll give you what you want. And yet, in their rejection, he still cares about them. I have seen the affliction of my people, for their cry has come to me. This is our God. He cares. He cares. He will not stop caring about you. He loves you. You're his beloved child if you have been redeemed by his son. He's heard the, the cries of affliction of his people. They're obviously afflicted by the Philistines, but they're also afflicted by their own sin by their rebellion, by their idolatry, by their disobedience. And Saul is going to come along and help deliver them from the affliction of the Philistines, but he is not going to be able to deliver them from the affliction of their sin. They would need another king for that. And God also tells Samuel that Saul is going to do something else in verse 17. It says that Saul is going to restrain my people. Now, some translations have this as Saul is going to reign over my people or Saul is going to rule over my people. But I think the ESV actually gets it right that he's going to restrain my people. The Hebrew word for restrain here is atzir, which usually has a negative connotation to it. It's the idea of, of closing up or shutting in 
or detaining, retraining, uh, I'm sorry, detaining, restraining, or imprisoning. He's going to restrain my people. It's almost as if God is telling Samuel that this young king will go on to do some good stuff for the nation of Israel. He's going to help deliver them from some enemies, but all in all, he is going to restrain them. He is going to restrain them from experiencing blessed communion with God. He's going to restrain them from enjoying uninhibited worship of God. He's going to restrain the people as he rules over them. In Garden Church, just because something makes you feel comfortable or secure or happy or peaceful, it doesn't mean that it's God's best for you. Sometimes there can be seemingly good things in your life that restrain you from the God things. We need wisdom to know the difference. That's why we need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto us. Seek first his kingdom instead of your own kingdom. And isn't it true that oftentimes we're trying to build our own kingdom? Maybe we're like the Israelites asking for someone or something to make everything better, but oftentimes we're looking to ourselves to sit on the throne of our lives, to do things, that, to do things the way that we want to do them so that we are in control of our own destiny and we can control our own success and our own happiness. But that's not always God's best for us. Seek first his kingdom. And if I can give you a caution, church, some of us are going to be more concerned with Donald Trump's kingdom in the next two months than we are with God's kingdom. We need to guard against that. Now, listen, I believe that we should vote. I believe that we should be informed voters, all right? I believe that we should know what's going on in our country and we should have a certain interest and I believe that more than anything, we should pray. And I would say we need to pray for mercy at this time in the history of our nation. But ultimately, we need to make sure that we are not becoming like the Israelites, trusting in a ruler instead of in the almighty God. Because here's what I can promise you, regardless of what happens on Tuesday, November 5th, God's going to get his person his man or his woman. Whoever becomes the next president of these United States is exactly who God wants to become president because there is no ruler, there is no king, there is no kingship that is outside of the authority that God establishes for us to have. And it might be in his grace that he gives us a king. It might be in his judgment that he gives us a king. And I would say that we're, already under the judgment of God. Just as the Israelites were demanding a king to suit their own fancy, I believe that sometimes God will give us what we want as long as we continue to become a people who move further and further away from him. A people who pervert justice. A people who desecrate truth. A people who kill our children a people who mutilate our children, a people who blur the lines of what is right and what is wrong. And God would just say, okay, here you go. But listen, Christian, next year, our president will change. The cabinet will change. Legislature will change. Policies will change. Perhaps even our freedom will change. But you know what won't change? The kingdom of God. And you know what else won't change? The mission inside the kingdom of God. Like perhaps we need to stop asking the question, well, gosh, what's going to happen, you know, depending on who gets in the office and what's going to happen with, with my life and my bank account and my freedoms. Because listen, we're not citizens of America. If you are a Christian, you are a citizen of heaven. We are just here passing by. We're sojourners, we're aliens, we're strangers. This is our temporary home, but we are citizens of heaven. 
And so we're not after having our best life now. If you got that book, throw it in the trash. You don't want your best life now. You want your best life then. This life is supposed to be difficult. It will be hard. But listen, regardless of what happens, God's kingdom mission does not change. God's kingdom for or his mission for you is to go therefore into all nations and make disciples. And it doesn't matter if that's with Donald or with Kamala. You have the same mission. Let, let, let's finish our, our narrative. Let's finish our chapter. Let's pick back up at verse 18. Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, tell me, where's the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them for they have been found. All right, so at this point, Saul's like, oh shoot, this guy really is a prophet. <laughs> I didn't even say anything about my donkeys and he's telling me about my donkeys. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? That's an interesting and really important verse at the end of verse 20. Essentially, what Samuel is telling Saul is, I'm here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of Israel's hope. All right, Israel's hope is on you. And then in verse 21, Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? And really, it seems as though at this point in time, Saul really is humble. He's like, why? Why me? Uh, but stay tuned because what we're going to see is with power, the humility is going to fade and arrogance will ensue. Verse 22, then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion I gave you of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, see what was kept is set before you eat because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you may eat it with the guests. All right, so Saul is be, being given the place of honor and the plate of honor. And so Saul ate with Samuel that day, verse 25. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, up, up that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose and both he and Samuel went out into the street. Just a uh, literary hidden Easter egg for you guys in this chapter. The word up is used nine times, signifying that this is the rise of Saul's reign. But look at the last verse. As they were going down, down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while that I may make known to you the word of God. And that's what we're going to see next week as Samuel anoints Saul as the king of Israel. But, but what we see there is that he's going down, right? And I believe that that word down there is used as foreshadowing to describe the fall of Saul's reign. He's going to go up, 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 but it's not going to last long. We see that word down twice there at the end of chapter nine. So what, what, what do we do? What do we do with this chapter? What do we do with first Samuel chapter nine? When I first read this chapter, I'll be honest with you. I was thinking, how am I going to get a sermon out of this? <laughs> like, this is just, we got some, you know, Saul's running around trying to find donkeys. What does this have to do with anything? This is just a random story. And as usually happens each week, as I study out the passage, I find that there is so much interesting and important information in the text that honestly I can't usually fit into a sermon. There's usually stuff that ends up on the cutting room floor as happened this week. And so chapter nine, what do we do because of chapter nine? What's the takeaway? What's the application? Yes, 
church, I want you guys to leave this place with a greater understanding and a greater expectancy of God's providence, that he works in mysterious ways in the mundane details of life. And yes, church, I want you to leave this place with a deeper commitment to drawing near to God in prayer and drawing near to God in biblical meditation so that he might speak to you more clearly and he doesn't have to send you on a wild donkey chase to get your attention. And yes, I want you to leave this place seeking first the kingdom of God and not get enthralled in a man-made kingdom. Yes and amen. But most of all, church, most of all, I want you to leave this place this morning with a greater affection for Jesus because you see that he is the king that you desperately need. He is the only king that will satisfy the longings of your soul. And so if you, if you stick with me another five minutes or so, I, I want to show you how this passage points to Jesus. All right, you guys doing okay? Hang with me, lean in, because this is really going to kind of be all over the place for the next five minutes, but this is really going to be fascinating if you can track with me. As we talked about last week, we left off at the end of chapter eight with God telling Samuel that he was going to give the Israelites a king. And so as we begin reading chapter nine, the expectation is that we are going to be introduced to the king, right? And that is what happens. But the first six words of chapter nine should have raised a huge red flag for us. The first six words, there was a man of Benjamin. We should read that and be like, wait, whoa, 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 hold up, full stop. A man of Benjamin, why? Why a man of Benjamin? That's not like Benjamin had become a, a, a terrible tribe. We, we saw in the previous book, in the book of Judges, that Benjamin had a deep history of corruption, of hatred, of rape, and of murder. And so why in the world would the king come from this tribe? Moreover, do you remember at the very end of Jacob's life, remember Jacob was a guy who had 12 sons, right? At the very end of Jacob's life, he blessed each of his 12 sons. Do you remember that? And when he got to Judah, this is what he said to Judah. Look up at the screen in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. It says, or he said, Jacob said to Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And so this is obviously kingdom language. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Who holds a scepter? A king. So why is the scepter being given to Benjamin instead of Judah? Well, let me show you something else interesting. 14 chapters earlier in Genesis chapter 35, verse 11, this will be up on the screen. At this point in time, Jacob has 11 sons. He doesn't yet have his last son, but at this point he has uh, 11 sons and God meets with Jacob at Bethel. And God says this, I am God almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall come from you and Kings shall come from your own body. And immediately after this, Rachel goes into labor and she gives birth to Benjamin. And so we, we think it kind of makes sense. Like God tells that Kings will come from you. And then he has a boy named Benjamin. And so which is it? Is it supposed to be Benjamin or is it supposed to be Judah? Well, something interesting happens between Genesis 35 and Genesis 49. And some of you are familiar with the story of Joseph, Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat as Hollywood or not Hollywood. Uh, what do you call it? Come on. Thank you. As Broadway would have it. Um, you remember the story of Joseph, right? That Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. And after years and years go by, years of God's providence, by the way, Joseph ends up as second in command in Egypt. And then there is a famine all throughout the region. 
But because Joseph has interpreted dreams, Egypt has stockpiled a bunch of food. And so everybody's going to Egypt to try to buy food. And Jacob tells his sons, hey, go to Egypt and see if you can buy some food for us. And so they go to Egypt, but Benjamin stays behind. Well, let's just, I I won't give you all the details. Let's just say they all go to, to Egypt, all right, the second or third time. And they ask for food and they don't realize that they're asking their brother for food. They don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them. And Joseph decides to test them. Joseph frames Benjamin by making it look like Benjamin has stole from him. Joseph tells his servants, hey, load up all their sacks with grain that they've purchased. And in the sack of the youngest, Benjamin, put my silver cup. And so they get their food and they they take off back home. And Joseph tracks them down. He's like, hey, you guys stole from me. What's going on? They're like, we didn't steal from you. We, we, we bought from you. We, we paid money and we got the, he's like, no, you stole my silver cup. And they're like, we didn't steal anything from you. We promise, my Lord. They don't know it's Joseph, right? We, we promise. And listen, we are honest men. If one of us stole from you, then listen, you kill the one that stole from you and the rest of us will be your slaves. How about that? And Joseph says, no, 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 we don't need to kill anyone. And you all don't need to be my slaves. But the one who stole from me, if one of you stole from me, that one should be my slave. And they're like, fine, that's the deal. We like, we're, we're honest men. And so they search through, you remember this, right? They search through all of their sacks one by one. And they get to Benjamin and they open it up. And there's the silver cup that Joseph had planted. And so now Benjamin, daddy's baby, is going to be a slave in Egypt, a servant of Joseph. And it's in this moment, you might remember, it's in this moment that Judah steps in and he speaks up and he's like, please, my Lord, don't take Benjamin. Like daddy already lost his favorite. He, he was you know, killed years ago. That's Joseph. He already lost that one. And now this is all he has. Please don't take him. Take me instead. Let me serve the sentence that he should serve. Let me stand in his place. Let me pay his punishment. And by Judah taking Benjamin's place, it seems that this also signified the transition in kingship from Benjamin to Judah, from the line of Benjamin to the line of Judah. And in a few short chapters in 1 Samuel, we are going to see the literal transition from Benjamin to Judah. Because David is from the line of Judah. And do you know who else is from the line of Judah? Jesus. Jesus. And just as Judah demonstrated the nobility of a king when he offered to stand in the place of his younger brother, so too Jesus in our place stood condemned. Jesus substituted himself for us on the cross at Calvary, where we should have been. Jesus took our punishment upon himself. Jesus paid the fine that we should have paid because the wages of sin is death and we are all sinners deserving of death. But he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus went to the cross in your stead, in the stead of all those who would believe, so that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And no longer will your life be required of you because Jesus gave his life. This is the great exchange of the cross. This is Jesus. This is our King, the Lion of Judah. And the scepter shall not depart from his hand. He will always and forevermore reign as king. Kings and presidents and prime ministers will come and go. Kingdoms will rise and kingdoms will fall. But as long as the Lord tarries, Jesus will always be on his throne. The scepter will not depart from Jesus. He is the king who rules and reigns over all. See, the Israelites demanded a king And they were excited, right? They're like, we're finally going to get a king. We're going to get our guy. He's going to be beautiful. He's going to be big and strong and everything's going to go well for us. And a thousand years later, there was another king and there was another donkey. 
And this king came riding in to Jerusalem on a donkey. Not exactly what you would expect of a king, right? Like, where's your noble steed? (laughs) What is this? But nevertheless, the people were excited about this king. They lined the streets for a couple miles, waving palm branches and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, Jesus, save us. See, they wanted to be saved from the tyrannical rule of Rome. They wanted to be saved from the oppression of Rome. They were hoping that Jesus would come along and be their warrior king who would make their lives comfortable and happy and safe. But Jesus didn't come to make us safe. He came to make us saved. He came to free us from the tyrannical oppression of sin, from the oppression of sin that, that, that holds us captive, that requires our lives of us. He came to shatter the chains and to pay the price so that we could be free. This is our king. How amazing is that? This is our king and we are in his kingdom. In church, there's work to be done. There's work to be done in his kingdom. He will rule and he will reign forever. And that ought to give us confidence. Regardless of what happens in this earth, we ought to rest. We ought to have confidence. We ought to have assurance because we know how the story ends. We go to live with the king forever. That's what he's promised to you. And now listen, if you're not in the kingdom, the invitation is there. You simply humble yourself. You repent and you trust in Jesus and you will be received into the kingdom. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to earn it. You can't. You simply look to Jesus who earned it in your stead. And if that's you this morning and you are unsure if you're in the kingdom, maybe you do the church thing. Maybe you're kind of a religious person. God doesn't care about religion. Look at the Pharisees. God cares about your heart and what comes out of the overflow and the abundance of your heart. And so if you would simply turn to him in faith and repentance and say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I need you. You will be saved and you will be safe from the tyranny of sin and death. And you pray with me. Father God, we are so thankful that you have sent us a king, a king that we need. Maybe not even the king that we would draw up in our minds because honestly, we're, we're still tempted to chase other kings and, and other distractions, other, other comforts or pleasures. But God, we are so thankful that you know what we need, that you sent Jesus to rule and to reign in our lives. And so God, would you help us to submit to his lordship? Would you help us to joyfully enter in to being used in the kingdom? Lord, we don't know how long it'll be until you return. But we do know that there's work to be done. We know that there are souls that are hanging in the balance. And so Father, would you use us in mighty ways, not to make much of us, but to make much of yourself because you are worthy and all glory, honor, and power are due your name. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.